are intractable instruments and essentially are very cold and very distant from a certain kind of reality. What Saab was said in his autobiography called words was that when you talk about something, you are reasonably distant, you are third hand, you really only have a pale version of that reality. And so when we talk, for example, about the crisis which engulfed European societies in the 17th century, do we really understand how unstable those societies had become? Do we really understand how disoriented the laboring poor in those societies had become? And do we really feel that in the gut? And do we understand, after all, how panic-struck and how frightened of a possible revolution, certainly a very real popular risings, the property classes of those societies were? You see, the point that I am making about that 17th century is that the fabric of traditional social order, the fabric of the society that people had known, had really begun to become dangerously unraveled. That the working poor, after all, the laboring masses, had been cut off, or at least great numbers of them, from the moorings that they had known for a long period of time from the international church that they had been members of, uh, from the life of the village collective that had been so much a support to them, certainly cut off from that kind of customary, even if fragile, security that they had in that village community, and certainly cut off, and this was what so was, was so very dangerous to the ruling classes and to the property elites of Europe, cut off from a kind of traditional and customary deference that they had always displayed toward those upper classes. And where would all of that lead? What would come of that crisis of the 17th century? In the long term, or so our comrade Eric Hobsbawm said, it would lead to capitalism. That after all, the most aggressive and the most class conscious bourgeoisie in Europe would finally crack the cadre of that traditional social order, being able thereby to expand the forces of production and being ultimately able to insert those laboring poor, that multi-headed monster in the eyes of the ruling classes of the 17th century, insert that laboring poor into the workings of industrial capitalism. And yet, and yet, it seems more complex than that. And it seems that we cannot really take all of that social turmoil of that chaotic 17th century, that we cannot take all of those radical aspirations and all of those popular risings that go on from one end of the century to another and compress them all within that very neat but rather simplistic schema that Hobsbawm gives to us. Because even that English revolution about whose radicalism, after all, you have been reading in Christopher Hill's magnificent book about the ranters and the ravers and the rockers and the rollers <laughs> and all of those sectarians of the 17th century, that even that English Revolution articulated aspirations which really had nothing to do with the beneficence of free market capitalism, which had nothing to do with the beneficence of time clocks and the assembly line, and certainly which did not not hold for the inviolability of private property. No, you see, the closer you come to those events, the closer you begin to feel the texture of them and begin to dig underneath them. You see that there is a thread that really runs through that 17th century, and that really is something that we can't ignore, something that is overpowering and instructive to us, and it is the thread of a class struggle, a class struggle that is very bitter and very explosive, and that goes on from one end of that century to the other. We are talking, after all, of about those efforts, desperate and very variegated, on the part of the laboring poor to save themselves. And we are talking no less about that very determined commitment on the part of the property classes, which we really must study in order to understand something about the technology of repression in modern society, their commitment to contain and ultimately to crush that mass of vagabonds and that mass of desperados. You see, if you remember that all of that economic expansion, 
and that religious revolution of the 16th century have really gone far in dismantling the workings of the old social and cultural order. It is true, of course, when you think back to that 16th century, that all of that economic expansion, all of that price inflation, all of that expansion of the perimeter of world trade had enriched the bourgeoisie, but it had systematically impoverished the laboring masses, that they were the great victims, after all, of the 16th century, and that is something fundamental to remember. And it is, after all, something that you understand in your own times, because if you think of your society in the world since the end of the Second World War, you are dealing, after all, with a society and with a world capitalism that has been in expansion, that claimed the miracle of that world system, and that, after all, saw the enrichment of bodies of capitalists in the vanguard, the Americans, of course, but look at what happened then to third world masses in the very same time period, those third world masses on whose backs, after all, that prosperity was built have become systematically immiserated, both relatively and absolutely. And so it was that in the 16th century, those laboring masses dropped into a depth of poverty and insecurity that really was unprecedented for a considerable <laughs> length of time. And consequently, you're dealing already with something explosive. The reasons for that we have alluded to. We have talked about the pressure of population on the available land supply or on the available job market and all of that too much pressure. Uh, we have talked about uh, that kind of feudal reaction, of uh, the intensification of feudal dues and feudal work services uh, so that the nobility uh, could keep up, after all, with an inflationary market. Uh, we have talked about uh, the enclosure of common lands, uh, which were so important a part uh, of the economic wherewithal uh, of the uh, laboring poor in the villages. And certainly we have talked uh, about that uh, transition and transformation uh, from arable land uh, into pasture, uh, which denied uh, that laboring poor uh, of a proper food supply. Uh, but it seems to me uh, that if you are really uh, to understand especially uh, that English Revolution of the 17th century, uh, and if you are to understand uh, why there was a revolution uh, that didn't succeed, as well as one that did, uh, we must zero in on England in terms of exactly what did happen uh, to that laboring poor in the 16th century so that we understand something about what we talk about when we say class struggle uh, in the 17th. And you see, the whole strategy of capitalist expansion uh, in England in the 16th century uh, had really, in a sense, conspired uh, to undermine uh, the economic position of the laboring poor, uh, had driven them uh, into impoverishment. Uh, consider uh, that very touchstone act uh, of the dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, because you must remember uh, that when the monasteries uh, were dissolved in the 1530s, uh, what the state succeeded in doing uh, was dissolving uh, the only institution uh, that had systematically uh, distributed charity and alms. Uh, because they are the monasteries, after all, uh, that had run the alms houses, uh, that had run the charity hospitals. And consequently, uh, when the monks uh, were put out to pasture, uh, or when they were simply integrated into the secular clergy, it meant uh, that those charitable institutions, as inadequate as they were, uh, simply fell into abeyance. Uh, and it's even more than that, uh, because uh, when those monastic lands uh, transferred hands, uh, when they passed to new owners, uh, they passed, unfortunately, for the laboring poor, uh, to much more efficient, uh, much more market-oriented, uh, much more wealth-concerned owners. Uh, the monastic owners uh, were reasonably uh, inefficient. Uh, they kept large amounts uh, of agrarian labor on their lands. Uh, they didn't rack rent their tenants, uh, but they sold, after all, or their land was sold by the state uh, to those who wanted to make money uh, 
very quickly. And consequently, they are uh, practically the classic types of those new owners of monastic land, of rack renting, or, or of enclosing, or of becoming sheep graziers, all of which means uh, that literally uh, by the thousands of uh, those who had been the tenants and those who had been the agrarian workers on those uh, monastic estates are severed from it and become part uh, of the landless, of uh, the uprooted, of uh, the vagrant, of uh, the new urban arrival. And then you see, it all touches all of uh, that frenzy of land exchanges uh, that we have talked about in detail, uh, which means uh, that there will be that uh, frenzy of enclosures, uh, which will mean uh, that transfer uh, from arable into uh, sheep pastures, and all of that uh, so very devastated uh, by the tens of thousands of uh, the peasantry uh, root loses its moorings uh, in the agrarian village. And add finally to that uh, the crux question, uh, which is the demographic question, uh, that that population increases in England uh, throughout the 16th century. It increases by 40%. And if you make any cursory examination uh, of the uh, parish records uh, of the 16th century, as Professor Jordan did in that very admirable book uh, on philanthropy and poverty uh, in Tudor and Stuart England, uh, you look at those records as Jordan did, and you are persuaded uh, that by 1550, especially in the southern counties of England and in the Midlands counties, that there was a very heavy problem of overpopulation. Given the amount of arable land available, given the amount of rural industry available for jobs uh, for those who needed them, for those who had to survive. Uh, all of which means uh, that literally again, by the tens of thousands, uh, those parishes fed uh, that insatiable maw which was called London. And London, after all, absorbed by the thousands of these villagers who could find no roots uh, in their home villages, in their parishes anymore. But you see, uh, those parishes uh, sent the poor into London less rapidly than the poor were multiplying in the parishes, but much more rapidly than jobs were being created in London. As a result is uh, that you confront and feel it, you confront a terrific insecurity. It really is such alienation. You find that replete in the 17th century especially. Uh, you get these men and young boys uh, going into these cities where they face vicissitudes they had never faced. There is no parish on which to depend. Uh, they face, after all, the shifts in the market, uh, from stagnation uh, to real depression. All the way along the line, uh, they are buffeted around by seasonal, uh, by seasonal unemployment until finally uh, by the deep depression uh, of the 17th century. And all of that uh, without any concern by the state. Uh, because when the state in England uh, composed its poor law, it was not interested in the urban poor. It was interested in the rural poor. It was interested in trying to maintain its villages and consequently no provisions of the poor law attended to those who were the dispossessed and the uprooted in the cities. Uh, <coughs> Professor Johnson of Exeter University has estimated uh, that by the time you come to the end of the 16th century in the city of London, 20% of the population are desperate paupers. Now you understand what that condition is if you add two other factors to it. And already you are making the setting for what will become a very exacerbated struggle in the 17th century. One is, of course, the deterioration of real income of the laboring poor, and especially in the cities, the real wages of those who are the day workers, of those who are the wage earners. What we're talking about is that wages did not keep pace with the inflationary spiral in necessities, in breadstuffs, in the things people needed uh, in order to survive. And consequently, the state, uh, which claimed to try to control prices, never did control prices adequately, but when it claimed to control wages, it did control them quite adequately, and consequently, the workers fell irrevocably behind.
And that is connected to a second factor because it softens them up. It makes them the victims of malnutrition. It makes them susceptible to anything. And so we're talking about the economic chaos created by plague and by epidemic disease. Mind you that in the years between 1480 and 1660, in that 180 year period of the Tudor and the early Stuart period through the revolution, that there are seven occasions when the bubonic plague strikes England. And that of those 180 years, half of them, or 90 years, are years in which one finds evidence of local epidemic disease of a wide scale in that local area. All of which means that the poor are vulnerable, they live in a shambles, they live in filth, they are undernourished, and when they go down, their families go down with them, and the economy grinds to a stop, and of course, affects by that stagnation, all of the others who remain in order to work. Does it surprise you that vagabondage was a great crisis in England as it was across the continent. Uh, we're talking about vagrants, we're talking about beggars. And Europe was full of beggars by the thousands and thousands in every country. Bands of beggars swarming across the countryside. In England, those, those bands were composed of former cotters in the villages, former agrarian workers, and sometimes the unemployed in the cities. Desperate men, men who could not find work, and they went around the only way they knew, which was to demand alms, to harass the people who didn't give alms. And the authorities and the ruling classes detested them and said they were a menace to public order, which they were. You see, in conceptual terms, vagrants, after all, are a classe dangereuse, a dangerous class, not a classe laborieuse, a working class, because they have no roots, they have no domicile, you can't keep track of them. There's no IBM card on them. They simply wander, and consequently always a threat. You don't know what they'll do, and if they get matches, they generally burn something. And consequently, there is an hostility which means very harsh, brutal laws against the vagrants, but more than harsh, brutal laws, a kind of ideology which says that these vagrants, after all, are not really poor and are not really hungry, but they are idle and lazy, and they're simply trying to rip off the society and see how easy it is to go from that concept to the concept that all of the poor are that way. It's the greatest convenience of all for a ruling class that doesn't want to look at its system, but you can't do it. You must, after all, address the problem of poverty if your society is in danger. There is a limit beyond which you cannot let social unrest and social upset go. And consequently, the Tudor state has to come forth with its poor laws. And the poor law that began it all was in 1572 a very inadequate one because mainly it dealt with vagrants. And it said that they were a pest in society, and they were not to be permitted. And consequently, if a vagrant was picked up the first time, he was beaten until blood came, and he then had a whole board in his cheek, and then had the chance to accept two years of compulsory labor at no pay. If he refused and was caught a second time, he could be executed. Beyond that, since they were called in the law the professional poor, beyond that, there was a category called the true poor. And the true poor were the invalids, the ones that couldn't get off the chair, the ones that were too old. And the true labor, or the true poor, were to be given some kind of relief by the parish, a list of them to be drawn up, some relief to be given. But nothing. No, nothing for those who were literally the unemployed, those who were the legitimate unemployed poor. Can you get away with that? Not in the 1590s. 
Because in the 1590s, England, like all of Europe, suffers a very sharp recession. And it suffers that sharp recession because of that abnormal uh, climatic condition that wrecked the harvest in England and on the continent for five years running from, 14, from 1594 to 1599. Uh, torrential rains uh, sweeping away the crop. Well, you know what that means. It's a classic kind of bread riot situation. It is the price of the necessities going up beyond what the people can afford to pay. And consequently, there begins to be terrific agitation in England. And so in 1495, you find bread riots in London. In that same year, uh, in the city of Norfolk, uh, you find that the poor are pillaging grain, uh, simply breaking into grain storehouses. Then you find in Somerset uh, that they are really beginning to burn, that there is arson, other kinds of felonies. And then the plot of Oxfordshire. In Oxfordshire, it was said uh, that one Bartholomew Steer, uh, who was himself a carpenter, had stirred up a pot and that the Oxfordshire workers uh, were going to combine with the London workers and they were going to cut down all of the grapes and all of the rich in English society and that was their idea because they were sore put to accept that system anymore but the war came in quickly and suppressed any such uprising and consequently 20 of them were executed just as 40 in Somerset were executed and so in that context the government has to legislate again, and it legislates the poor law of 1597, amended in 1601, again the harsh rule on vagrants, but this time there is such a thing as the unemployed poor as well as the true poor, and there are then to be poor rates that are to be levied on the parish. Uh, that the parish is to take care of these unemployed who are willing but can't find work, but how? You never give outdoor relief. You never simply give a dole. Because if you give a dole, after all, uh, you are letting those poor beat the system. And consequently, you can't permit that. No. You make for those workhouses, those god-awful workhouses, and it's there that the parish will provide for them, and it doesn't even do that. And you get down to that period of the 1620s, which is a really bona fide depression in which the poor are really suffering, and the government is doing nothing about forcing those parishes to introduce poor rates what it is doing is encouraging the English population to give private charity and encouraging, of course, the magistrates to keep public order at all costs. What is in England is elsewhere. On the continent, it is no better. It is a condition of Europe. And consequently, in one document after another, you hear those plates uh, by those who are the betters, those who leave documents, that the streets are filthy and pestilential and stink from all of those poor. And finally, it aroused the Pope. The Pope, Sixtus V, in a bull in 1587, finally couldn't stand all those vagrants on the streets of Rome, and he complained bitterly of these vagrants wandering through all of the streets and squares of the city in search of bread. They fill with their groins and cries not only the public places, but the private houses, but and also the churches themselves. They provoke alarms among our better people. They make incidents. They roam like brute beasts with no other care than the search for food to appease their animal-like hunger and to replenish their bellies. And in Paris in 1596, uh, that very aristocratic observer, Pierre de L'Estoile, leaves this memoir of how Paris looks at that time. The crowds of poor in the city streets, so great that one can pass through. I find in those poor only masks and images of death, naked and terrible, 
or clad in a ragged, torn robe, as if everyone were a skeleton or a corpse. And of course, it's not a pleasant thing to watch for somebody passing in a carriage. And so it is that in the cities of Europe in the 16th century, it is estimated roughly that 20% were desperate paupers. And that after all, the vagrants who were passing by all the time, moving from place to place, the constant enemy of all established order. Uh, so that Queen Margaret of Hungary, who is the governor of the Netherlands in 1554, orders the vagrants to the galleys, all vagabonds who beg alms reads her edict. All vagabonds who beg alms without their poverty resulting from any honest causes, but solely from way waywardness and pure sloth. And that's the way they looked at it. But you see, we have just been talking about the dispossessed. We have been talking about the class dangereuse. But suppose it is the class laborieuse in the 16th century. Suppose they are those who are still working the land and those who still have a craft. And they likewise are alienated from the society. And that is more dangerous because they begin to collectivize their revolt. And the roots of it are in the 16th century and you must know that to understand what the pressure of the 17th will mean. We are talking about risings of peasants and risings of artisans. And the issues about which they rise are fascinating. Sometimes they are together in collaboration, and that's always very effective, sometimes separately. But I want you to note, just in the morphology of social movements, that townspeople, towns workers, and peasants are different in the way in which they function in social movements. The social movement of the town is easily got together. The workers gather in the streets. Immediately they block off a district. They have, after all, a barricade. They use the tools of their industry as weapons, and their explosions are rapid and bloody, but easily put down because the cities are also the places where the royal governors are and are also the places that can easily gather royal troops around the city in order to crush the uprising. With the peasants, it's different. They respond more slowly and less frequently, but when they do, it is a veritable war and it threatens the society. 1548 in France. Interesting indeed. And it is, after all, in that province of Guyenne. And the province of Guyenne, which is in uh, western and southwestern France, in 1548 there is an uprising of peasants that links to so much you must understand about the morphology of the 17th century. The cause, it is against the state. And it is against an oppressive state that is pressing down taxes. And that will become the leitmotif. And don't underestimate it. There is something revolutionary about saying at this early stage in the development of a centralized state and a centralized monarchy that we will not have it and that we will not permit feudalism to be nationalized so that it is now the state that will take our feudal dues in the form of taxes. And so you see in the opening decade of that 16th century, uh, the King of France, Francis I, had been busily at work uh, making a centralized monarchy, uh, creating a bureaucracy, uh, creating royal courts, uh, ultimately, of course, creating a royal tax system uh, so that he should get the money uh, that enables him to carry on those crazy political and international projects uh, which uh, power-hungry kings are really into. And so in 1541, what he does is to impose the Gabet, the salt tax, the hated salt tax, in provinces where it had never been, in the provinces of the west and the southwest of France, provinces that were conquered lately and consequently had been exempted from it. 
And so between 1544 and 7, uh, there are already riots and already disturbances against the Gabel. And then, in the summer of 1548, after the peasants had come together in village after village, in district after district, and formed a veritable peasant army, there was an uprising against that state and its tax collection. And so what they did was to surround every city in which there was a gabelle, in which there was a gabelle tax collector. And then they occupied those cities and they executed the tax collectors. And the last one was the city of Bordeaux. And they got into the city of Bordeaux and there was the royal governor for Dieppe. And the silly man, an aristocrat, thought that he would go and buy off the peasants <laughs> and tell them to go away. And he demanded to see them. They said, come see us. He did, and they killed him. <laughs> At that point, they wrote to the king, Henry II, and they said, we have taken these cities, we have executed the tax collectors, now we expect you to end the gabel, plus a list of other taxes that we here state. Henry II played for time and calmed them. He told them, yes, yes, he would do that, and consequently they disarmed themselves and went back, after all, to their farmsteads, and what he did was to raise a royal army. And consequently, that royal army, which was mercenary, marched on Bordeaux, or where those peasants were still holding forth, entered the city, and crushed them with a ferocity that is still remembered. And consequently, that repression at Bordeaux is important in the consciousness, but also the fact that in the very next year, 1549, the king abolished the gabel in that province, figuring that it was too dangerous. Ha uh ha. -huh. So, it wasn't wholly a defeat. And you see those two factors, and also the fact that when, when they made their rising, they shouted not Viva la France, but they shouted Viva la Guienne, that they had rights that predated the state. This is Native American stuff, you see. This is Quebec stuff. That they have rights that predate that state. <coughs> Viva la guerre. And so there is a tradition that builds from that. And you go in France to those years 1579 to 80. And what had happened is that Protestantism had made its way in the southwest and in the southeast of France. And it had made its way because the Protestant pastors in France were much less rapacious, much less, uh, much less uh, into cupidity, uh, much less uh, 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 licentious in the way in which they comported themselves than these Protestant pastors, an honest type. And furthermore, they supported the tax revolt of the peasants. So you come to 16, 1579 and you are in the midst of the religious wars in France, and these Protestant peasant villages in the province of the Dauphiné are being worked over, after all, by the royal armies, by the Catholic armies, and there are all kinds of hostages that are being taken, and heavy taxes are being imposed upon them, and consequently, in January, of 1579, the peasants of the Dauphiné in these Protestant villages for the most part, although many Catholics also, come together in an assembly and decide to make an armed resistance to the ravages of the soldiers and to the tax burden that they bear. At that point, in the city of Roland, which is the leading city at that particular time of the Dauphiné, in the city of the Lomar, there is an urban rising. There is a rising led by an artisan in the city of Oman that seizes the city and that consequently makes it a popular commune. The man's name is John Jean Serve, S-E-R-B-E, -E, 
We don't know much about him, but quite a leader, and took this city and kept it as a popular commune for more than a year. And what happened was a coalition of this urban uprising and this peasant uprising, and the Dauphiné was in revolution by 1580. And in the year 1580, in the summer, it is the Queen Mother that comes to the city of Roman to see Jean Cell. That is Catherine de Medici. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Catherine de Medici, but I give you a little psychic insight into her. And that comes from a marvelous movie that was made once by Sacha Guitry, a movie called The Pearls of the Crown. And he has in this movie a scene of Catherine de' Medici when she is nine years old in a convent. And the narrator says, even at nine, she showed those genial and gentle qualities that would characterize her throughout life. And you look, and there is this little girl with the throat of another little girl in her hand beating the hand. <laughs> She comes, and Jean Cell, who is the leader of this rebellion, respected by the peasantry also, answers the request for an interview, stands in front of the queen, and her, uh, her uh, helpers and her uh, gentlemen, of course, immediately shout, Ajanou, Ajanou, get to your knees, get to your knees. Jean Cell refuses, the queen dismisses him, says she will have nothing to do with that veal rebel that rebel city. And so it is that she contacts the bourgeoisie that had had to flee the city of Roman, supplies them with weapons, they form an army, and consequently, by the end of 1580, they have really decapitated Jean Cell and ended that commune in the city of Roman. It is again a royal army that comes and crushes the peasantry in blood. It fails. But it leads to the legacy of the Cocomte. And the Cocomte are important because they represent something throughout the 17th century. And they are something very different from that straight road to capitalism. Now, Cocomte, you see, is a pejorative word. It means blockhead. And the Cocon, that is a name given to these insurgent peasants uh, by their enemies, quite obviously. And so the first Cocon War breaks out in the Limousin, around the city of Limoges. And it breaks out in Périgord, around the city of Périgueux. And it breaks out there in the south of France, in the Midi of France, in 1593, and lasts almost three years until 1595. And this is serious. And these peasants at this point want nothing of these religious wars. What they say in the manifesto that they draw up is really quite magnificent because they indicate that they want nothing to do with all of this cutthroat in, in these inter-religious wars. In their manifesto of March of 1594, these cocons say of the bourgeoisie, uh, they seek only the ruin of the poor people, for our ruin is their wealth. All religious intolerance is forbidden among us. We swear to love and cherish each other as God has commanded. All decisions which we make will be made in democratic assemblies, and all of that was true. The armies of the Crocom were Protestant and Catholic together. The assemblies that they held were the assemblies in which they made their decision. They ultimately got together an army of 40,000 to try to liberate the south of France from that weight of the state which was falling hard to replace feudalism on the backs of the people. But the king at this time was the shrewd one. The king was Henri IV, was Henry IV. And if you're going to have a king in your lexicon of heroes, you may as well choose Henri IV, because he was an extremely intelligent guy and a great co-opter, in fact. And so he co-opted this movement in a very, very underhanded way, but ultimately played his cards very shrewdly. What he did was simply to buy off a certain number of peasants, 
to pay them all and to tell them to spread Catholic Protestant dissension in the armies of the Kokon. They did this, and by 1595, those armies had split into two, Catholic and Protestant, which weakened them immeasurably and led to their defeat. But when they were defeated in 1595, after three years of struggle against royal taxes and royal war, then Henry IV said, there will be no retribution. There will be no executions or what have you. And he thought to buy off the Colcon that way. But you see what the entire legacy is, that the peasants now are not simply a hydra-headed mass, but they are a serious movement, a class enemy with which the state has to bargain. And that informs the whole revolutionary movement of the peasantry in the course of the 17th century. <clears throat> All of this happens in France, it happens in Austria, it happens in Finland, it happens in Germany, it happens in Hungary. It is uprising in that end of the 16th century everywhere. And so a practice only. That's what the 16th century did. So you can imagine how it was in the 17th. Because there you have a century mired in real economic depression, very deep from the uh, 1650s on, and mired also in catastrophe and in war. Note, after all, the great famine of the years 15, 1654 to 1659. Years of famine that would be revolutionary years in Europe. But think for a moment of war, and think of how crazy <laughs> that whole thing is. That the 17th century is the craziest century of war until our own. And in the 17th century, they were fighting idiotic, lunatic, religious wars, killing each other off. Communists versus Democrats, Protestants versus Catholics and then into all kinds of very tawdry layout politique. And so it is that you have an 18-year war in the Netherlands. The Netherlands struggling for its independence against Spain, 1568 to 1648, 80 years, and it ruins the southern part of the Netherlands, which we call Belgium. The city of Antwerp, which had been such a booming city, destroyed, destroyed economically. The craftsmen of that area of Belgium emigrating into Italy, into Germany, into England, and especially into the north, the new Dutch Republic. All of that destroying part of that country. Or take the Thirty Years' War, the Thirty Years' War between 1618 to 48, which ravaged Germany, which laid her low. It is estimated that in the Thirty Years' War, 30% of the urban population and 40% of the peasant population died in Germany. It is estimated that the Rhineland, where every army fought, was laid waste. And so the class struggle will get deep. So let's return to England and see how it gets deep. Because between 1620 and 1640 in England, that depression is very real. It is a terrific economic stagnation. And what it does is to hit the clothing manufacturing areas especially. It hits the areas of West Riding, the areas of Somerset, in other words, that most important trade in Great Britain, that most important industry, really goes under. And you begin to get then tremendous kinds of apprehension. You get, for example, the apprehension of, a, of the High Sheriff of Somerset, who is going to write to the, the Privy Council announcing the dangers of this depression. Listen to this from 1622. A tumultuous assembly of the poor in the eastern part of the country has been quieted 
but I must warn the council that trade is dead and there is no reserve for those dangerous poor who are without work and who know not how to live except rebellion. In other words, the danger was very bad, was very real. Two years later, in 1624, it is a minister in the city of Somerset looking at all of that poverty, a minister named Ebor, who proposes massive colonization, especially to Newfoundland, the Newfoundland plan. Send the poor off there. Well, his friends in neighboring Bristol had great investment in the plantation in Newfoundland and consequently wanted cheap labor. But in Eborn's treatise of 1624, he says that we in England, after all, and this a very early variant of the Malthusian theory, we in England have been deprived of those two most providential checks upon population, war, and plague. And consequently, we are really confronted with all of this excessive population. And so, those must go who are the vagrants, the squatters, the criminals, all that superfluous crew who disturb the quiet of the realm. And so it was that in the year 1628 to 31, the quiet of England is disturbed. And there are mass riots. It is in the year 1629, for example, that the king himself, Charles I, wanting to embrace within the royal lands part of the forest of Dean, confronts rioting peasants and cannot usurp that land. Those are years when there are attacks upon fences, attacks upon those enclosures, when there is an insistence, after all, that the old common lands be restored. It is a period when the term, the many-headed monster, comes into the mouths and into the writing of the ruling class. The poor are the many-headed monster. They are considered a mob without a single head, in other words, without thought, without direction, just marauding. A very, very pejorative way of looking at them. It is, after all, that marvelous leveler, William Walwyn, who satirizes what the ruling class says about the people. The people, they say, is a pitiful, mean, helpless thing as under schoolmasters in danger to be whipped and beaten in case they meddle without leave and license from their master. And that is the point. It isn't that there is an host that it isn't that there is a belief that these poor are as monstrous as that. It is that there is a fear. It is the fear that if the poor are not deferential, if there is not social control, then all of the order of England will be destroyed. You get it very clearly in a pamphlet of 1631 by a royalist on the need for social control. Without laws, by which we mean parliament, by which we mean the king, by which we mean the church, without laws, the beast with many heads will be head of all. And society will be at the mercy of the rage of the harrowing multitude. And what really got them was that they knew these ruling classes, that the gap between rich and poor was growing wider. And so a gentry brochure of 1641, the fourth part of the inhabitants of most of the parish of England are miserable poor people and without any subsistence. They couldn't cure it. They didn't know how. They simply didn't want to be disturbed. And consequently, they had to be controlled that multi-headed monster. But you see the crisis that really is generated intramurally in the ruling class. The intramural crisis between parliament and king, between sectors of the ruling class, begins to involve the people. And from May of 1640, there is not a single public episode or debate that goes on between parliament and king that is not reacted to and participated in on the streets by those who are the many-headed monsters.
cannot be stopped yet. And in France at the same time, just a word. Oh yes, death. Famine year after famine year. 1639, 1641, 1647, 1649, the general hospitals. No, no, you don't let the poor on the streets. You don't give them outdoor relief. You make these so-called general hospitals. What they are are semi-monastic workshops where the workers work from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. And where, after all, if they are sinners because they are lazy, they are punished. But if they work well, they are rewarded by being told that they will be saved. And consequently, you already have that system that Foucault is talking about when he writes about prisons and when he writes about mental institutions, that somehow you get those people who embarrass the system out of your visibility and put them away and there punish them by telling them that they are embarrassing you by not working. And it is the time of Saint Vincent de Paul, Saint Vincent de Paul, the original one. <laughs> and in the middle of the 17th century, he is the one who said constantly, as though it were a broken record, Jesus loves the poor, but it is the Vincentian order that ran more of these workshop hospitals than any other. And the one that Saint Vincent himself ran was called Nom de Jesus, the name of Jesus. And he put that to that incarceration of the poor. Well, you see, this is only the 17th century. They went from prosperity to depression and didn't know how to stop it. They had poor, and they didn't know how to stop that. They didn't know how to stop unemployment. And you see what terrific progress we've made in these three centuries. And consequently, there is, in this whole setting that I have made for you, the question, how then do the poor resist? If the rich insist upon social control, if they will not permit reaction. How do you resist? What is resistance in the 17th century? I leave you with a very interesting thought, that between 1580 and 1640, there were accused in Europe tens of thousands of witches. Tens of thousands, most of them old women. And it was said that they greased themselves with the grease of children that they had killed, and that they sweeped through keyholes, and that they went on broomsticks or airborne goats, and that they finally arrived at the witches' Sabbath. And there at the witches' Sabbath, they had all kinds of commerce with the devil. And there were learned treatises on whether if you had sexual intercourse with the devil, he could reproduce, or she could reproduce, as the case might be. And there was reference back to Thomas Aquinas, who seems to have written on it. And consequently, there was all of that. And you are into something that it is so good that we have purged from our system, witch hunting. <laughs> you are into witch hunting. Why? And why do you take up all of these houses and accuse them and torture them and force them to confess? Well, it's fairly obvious because in times of tension and in times of crisis, obviously the diversion to some weak group that can't fight back Gypsies and Jews, the Nazis chose, homosexuals they chose, groups that had no clout 
of staying power within that structure. Okay, you choose witches, and you say that there is a diabolical plan in the world, the protocols of the elders of the devil. And consequently, you say that all of that, all of that is responsible for the malevolence in the society. But if you are an old woman, and they don't have any clout in society, and if you are an old woman, maybe you say you're a witch. And maybe that's the way you get back. Because if you go around door to door, and nobody gives you arms, and you simply say, that's all going to die, then you get it. And consequently, it replaces the community and the charity that is lost. Witchcraft suddenly becomes a double-edged sword in the 17th century. It shows you, in almost symbolic terms, that there is a class struggle involved in this. Who will use the witch? <laughs>